ideas that are that I'm very passionate about, and Dorothy's quotes were um, right along the line of where I come from when I think about environment and conservation. And so what I'm going to do is start with what I work on most, which is in areas of conservation, but then I'm going to pivot to new perspectives on how we can ascribe value to conservation. And so where I want to start is by telling you about one of my passions, and that is on my search for the rarest butterfly in the world. And the rarest butterfly in the world could be anywhere, but it turns out that um, North Carolina itself is a hotspot for some of the rarest butterflies in the world. So I'm just going to show you one, rather than kind of do a tour through the rarest butterflies. This is the St. Francis Seder. And, well, it's brown. I think it's beautiful, but, you know, it's subtly beautiful. And <clears throat> this butterfly is found, I have to look at this for a second, its entire worldwide range is found in blue on this slide. Don't want to stand in your way. <laughs> and no, that is not a speck of dust on the screen. It is right there. Wow. There's a blue spot, and that is it. And so this butterfly has a very limited range. You find it almost nowhere. In fact, I think nobody in this room could actually see it, because where it is found is on the Fort Bragg Army installation <coughs> only. And it's actually even more narrow than that. So here I am standing in a habitat known as a cane break, which would have covered many wetland areas in North Carolina 200 years ago. And now it's almost impossible to find them. Uh, but the one place I've seen many of these cane breaks is at Fort Bragg. And the one place I see them is in the bomb zone. And so this big smile on my face is not because I see butterflies, because I haven't been blown up by a bomb yet. <laughs> and, but they're amazing places. This is where the rarest butterflies are. This, it's sort of a paradox that the butterflies are common, where we seem to have the greatest disturbance, <coughs> that is army training and bombs dropping, and yet those bombs actually replicate some of the natural conditions that are otherwise removed from the landscape. So that's my total tour of the rarest butterflies in the world for today. But I just want to say, before I pivot on to other topics, why should anybody care about the rarest butterflies in the world? These are rare, rare butterflies. They might occur in numbers like 100 or 1,000. Like if you took all the butterflies and made a ball out of them, you could hold them in a ball like this. And so they don't have they basically have no benefit for their and the environments that they live in. They can't serve as food for other animals. They're just too rare. They don't pollinate. These, these butterflies don't pollinate at all, so they don't benefit ecosystems in that way. So why should we care to conserve them? And my own view on this is that there are plants and animals on this earth that we should conserve for ethical reasons. Humans shouldn't be causing them to be wiped off, wiped off the face of the planet. So that's one. I, I wanted to just give you that perspective before launching in the, into other parts of my talk, which have a very different perspective on why we should conserve. But first, I want to start with this picture. And so when I look at a picture, when I look at a, a picture like this one of a landscape, the first thing that pops out to me is what? The forests have been cleared. There are hardly any forests left in this picture. But then what remains is interesting, and that's my area, one of my areas of research. So you see the bigger forested area in the back that's on the hills, but then as we come out into the agricultural land, those forests follow a um, uh, winding shape, that is, they're following the long streams. And so what I think about are habitats like these that we call landscape corridors. They're like super highways for plants and animals, so they can actually get around this landscape. They're not going to go through big agricultural fields or through cities. So what I think about is conserving these to conserve nature. And this is now I think about wildlife, plants and animals and other things. And so just to, and I hope this isn't too small, but I'll just tell you what these are. These are pictures of where 
people have made these corridors. Um, this picture, and I know you can't read the text, but the dark green at the top is Duke Forest. The light green down here is Durham County Open Space. So this is like right where we're standing almost. And the white, the lighter green in the middle here, is a corridor connecting these two areas that are protected. And the Triangle Land Conservancy paid $100,000 to make this connection for plants and animals. And then on the right is sort of the, the, the corridor of all corridors. This is a corridor that runs from Yellowstone National Park, which is here, 1,800 miles north into the Yukon. And this is an interesting one because this picture is sort of a glass half, em half empty, glass half full. The um, darker green areas are actually national parks or state parks. They're protected. And the light green areas are places that are not protected. They're the vision for the future. But the Nature Conservancy spent a half billion dollars uh, four years ago to help make a corridor in this region conserving area uh, land is here. Well, I think about these corridors from the perspective of plants and animals. What, how can we conserve them in these landscapes where habitat has been lost? But let me tell you another perspective about these corridors, and one that I've come around to eventually just in the last few years. Oh, before that, I just want to say my work is on this question, do corridors work? And so these, this idea is, you know, does this, does this bear a benefit from running down the corridor rather than across the road? And there's all sorts of ways that bear or other plants and animals can benefit. But when you look at these corridors in a different way, then there's a different reason for conserving them. So for, we might want to conserve them for plants and animals, but there are big corridors, like in the Appalachians or elsewhere, that are emerge from making big national parks or big state parks that make beautiful places for people. And so people like to have these areas, yes, for plants and animals, but because they like to go there and be, like Dorothy was saying, in, the, um, in places that are natural and remote. So people have value for these corridors. But then, I mean, these are big corridors, but they're smaller ones. So what this is meant to convey is corridors that go through agricultural areas. And don't read the writing. What I'm meaning to show here is the natural area along this stream that benefits the water quality of the stream. There's reasons that people want to make corridors besides for plants and animals. In um, Great Britain, there are hedgerows that form corridors through agricultural fields that bees benefit from and other animals and plants. And then if we go down, this is agricultural landscapes, but in our own communities, we find these connections through the landscape where here we have a city and there's all those little strips through it. They're bike, they might be biking paths or they might have other, some other benefit to people, but they also benefit nature. And so the point of these slides is to say, Yes, I came into it thinking, how do, how can we conserve landscapes in ways that benefit wildlife? But people have other values, not just wildlife, and they make these areas because they have other values. And so what the rest of my talk will be is how can we um, assess the value of nature? for people. And when I say value, there's many ways that we can think about value. And so what I want to do is just give you examples of how people that want to understand the value can put different values on um, nature. And so I've talked about the value, I mean, there is one value to conserving the rarest butterflies or other plants and animals. That's one value. And it's a value that some people have, but not all people have. And if that's the only value we're clinging to, it's going to result in the loss of nature. But there are many values that people get from ecosystems. And so what I've asked here is, what services do ecosystems provide to people? And there are different classes of services. So my first few slides are just going to give examples of how um, how ecosystems benefit people. So 
nearly all of our seafood, for example, comes from natural ecosystems, where if we don't have natural fisheries, we aren't going to have food that feeds people. And then our agricultural systems, well, they're more managed. And yet there are benefits to having, well, that nature provides benefit to those agricultural systems. It uh, leads to productive soils or other environments that benefit the growth of agricultural crops. And so uh, nature provides a pharmaceutical pro pro uh, product, so aspirin and many other commonly used uh, uh, pharmaceuticals are derived from nature itself. Okay, so that we call provisioning services. There are other ways that, um, that nature regulates our environment. And so ecosystems, nature is important in storing carbon. So if we're worried about, and I am, worried about the rise in carbon in the atmosphere, well, there's different ways to remove carbon. One is by stopping, to burn, stopping burning fossil fuel. Like that's one, but if we let ecosystems recover, well, what are the plants and ecosystems? They're mainly carbon, so they're just sopping up carbon out of the atmosphere. And they help in other ways by decomposing waste and cycling nutrients that are important for ecosystems. Okay, so let me give you one of the classic examples of how these services, the value of these services is quantified. New York City was requires water inputs from the Hudson River. And the Hudson River, as populations grew and grew, was becoming more and more polluted and more and more difficult to use for people. And so they considered building a water treatment plant. And the water treatment plant was going to cost $6 billion. Well, they looked for alternatives, and $6 billion is a lot of money. What they found is that if they could conserve areas upstream, so these are the green areas on the map, if they could conserve areas upstream, those natural systems would purify the water for them and for the cost of less than a billion dollars. So for less than a sixth of the price, they could conserve land and have a, benefit, a direct benefit for what people need, pure, clean water. Okay, so another area of um, services are called supporting services. So I'm a, I study animals and insects, so this is one I can easily think about because I think about pollinators, that like bees or other things that are important for our crops or for ecosystems. I think about the types of insects that control pests in our agricultural crops or in our daily lives. And then natural ecosystems that are important in purifying air and water. And so just to give one example of this, and I'm trying to bring it around to ideas in uh, relation to services for people in North Carolina, well, Mary set me up perfectly with her comment, because I have my Super Bowl slide here. And you can love or hate the Super Bowl, I mean, Mary, I don't know, I'm taking it, you don't, you're not watching the Super Bowl. I'm not either, but maybe you are. And I was talking to a friend last night at the Nature Conservancy. She said, tomorrow's a Super Bowl. You have to get the Super Bowl into your talk. So here's my, my attempt. <laughs> so then Gretchen set me up perfectly as well by bringing up, well, what do people do during a Super Bowl? Well, one thing they do is they drink beer. And so what this graphic is showing is by the My Fitness Pal is the consumption of various things, pizza, chips, but a beer is in white here. So like, this is the typical day of beer consumption, and this is the Super Bowl beer consumption. <laughs> now, you might be wondering, like, why in this talk to your group am I bringing up beer in the Super Bowl? All right, so the real point is to get to beer and ecosystem services, and so then you can ask this question. Why is it that big breweries are relocating to the mountains of North Carolina? So you get Sierra Nevada, which is based in California. You get New Belgium Brewing, which is based in Colorado. They are relocating, I mean, really in mass to Western North Carolina. And why is that? And there, there are many reasons. There are a few reasons. But one of the biggest reasons is for the nature services that are provided. That is abundant water and clean water 
that is required in the brewing process. And they recognize this. They're talking with conservation organizations about how they can partner both to more ethically produce beer, but frankly, it's also to sustain their business. They have get that they bring value out of nature. And so then another example of how we see these um, supporting services is in pollination. And this is an image that comes from a student that's working in Puerto Rico right now. And she's asking, how is it, oh, sorry, flipped up. Um, she's asking, how is it that forest areas benefit coffee plantations? And it's hard to see this, but on the left, that's a shade grown coffee plantation. On the right is, you know, just a level field that's planted in coffee. And she's asking, what is the value of, first, the type of plantation, and second, the value of nearby forests to, um, to uh, creating a home for pollinators that can then go out and improve the productivity of coffee while maintaining the natural environment. And so this is, next one is a graphic that, don't focus on the details. This is a graphic from Costa Rica. The white area in the center is coffee and the black areas around are forests. And so a graduate student asked, well, what is the value of those forests for coffee production? And so he measured coffee production at different places near and far from the forest. And what he found is that natural pollination in the natural areas increased the value of a 480 um, hectare, so a thousand acre, um, coffee plantation by $60,000 a year. So by maintaining some forest, a farmer would receive a great benefit because there were more um, coffee berries produced. And there are other benefits like this. I don't want to, I'm going to show some graphics. I'm a data, I like data. So I'm going to show some graphics, but it's not really about looking at the details. Um, this is all you have, don't look at all the dots here. I'm just showing you a down trend. And what this is is the relationship between the number of types of mammals and the density of infected ticks. As you increase the types of mammals, the diversity of natural life, you decrease the likelihood, this is in the Northeast, you decrease the likelihood of Lyme disease. And then you can ask, well, why is that? You know, what's happening here? And what's happening is the reason you go to the left is because habitats are lost. And then you have smaller areas of habitat, they have smaller numbers of mammals, and they tend, the ones that tend to make it are the ones that are good um, reservoirs for Lyme disease, and so it's easily spread around. So again, again, another value of natural areas. And then another class of values are called cultural services. Basically, people like to get out into nature, and they value having nature there. It could be to fish, or it could be to take nice walks, or rest on the rock in western North Carolina, but people benefit from nature. Okay, so then the next graph, oh, and then, so here's an example of actually putting a monetary value to the benefits of nature. So this is work from Namibia National Parks, that's what's on the left. And what's, what this is quantifying is the number of large wildlife species. These would be things like elephants and lions and other things. And then the likelihood of a local community having income from the presence of nature reserves. And what you find is that the more large man, uh, animals, the more money is made by people. And so these are local people in Namibia who are benefiting from creating natural areas and saving them and not letting them be changed to whatever, towns or agriculture or other things. And so my next graphic, do not pay attention to any of the details in this graphic. I hate putting up tables like this. But it's only meant to convey that it's a big table. And what the big table is showing is in 1997, a group of scientists asked, what is the value to people of all the ecosystems in the world? So that's what all these lines are. Ignore those lines. 
What they came up with, though, that's what I want to convey, is this large number, $33 trillion a year. So the idea is that if you annihilated all of nature, we would have to reproduce through some human technologies, most of which don't, don't exist, $33 trillion worth of infrastructure. Now, I will tell you that, I mean, this was like, a, in my view, it was like a back of the hand calculation. So I wouldn't put any stock in the number 33 trillion, but I would just put stock into the fact that it's a big number. It's a big number. And the, other, the one reason I don't like the number 33 trillion is that this, what this graphic is showing is, in the blue, the value of ecosystem services. And in the yellow, the amount of revenue generated by people each year. And so to make that number higher than that number, well, it's unclear what that actually means at that point. But anyway, it's a big number. OK, so this is where I take a big shift. And I don't want to get involved too much in the details. But what I do want to tell you is that there are groups out there, there are conservation organizations that have whole programs dedicated to looking at different ways to conserve nature and then to give people alternatives based on the services that ecosystems provide. This is a group led by Gretchen Daly, um, who a, a friend of Judith's and mine. She runs a group called the Natural Capital Project. And their whole aim is to tell people what is the value of, e of natural environments and what are the different kinds of value that balance you know, making cities or making farm fields, other uses of the land. And so what I want to do is not dwell on, I'm going to flash up a few slides, but my main point is that they have the infrastructure to do this at first. And so don't pay attention to the details here, because all I want to point out is that they set up the models, they have different scenarios, whether you create a city, a field, what have you. And then there's a bunch of models that deal with all these different services that I just walked you through. And then you can have results that say, you know, how can we change the land to have benefits for people, for agriculture or cities, but also have as much benefit as we can for ecosystems. And so I'm not, this next slide is not to look at at all. It's just to say they're creating tools where you can tell them what you want to do with your landscape, and it'll tell you what you're going to get out of your landscape. And so then you get examples like this. And I found out this morning that Judith actually lived here. This is the Willamette Valley in Oregon, where the Willamette Valley looks, this is what it looked like in 1990. And when I say what it looked like, all those colors represent different uses of the land. So the big yellow blotch in the middle is land that's put to grasses to make grass seed, essentially. And then what the Natural Capital Project did is ask, well, if you just keep going on like this, what does the land look like? And if you keep going on in a different direction that values conservation, what does the land look like? And what I notice as a big difference right away is, and you might not be able to see this in the back, but there's lots of green areas here. That's more for us in the conservation plan. And then, what they can ask is, well, what happens then if we do one thing or another? For example, what do we do to soil conservation? And so this is just over time, some measure of conservation of soil. And all you need to get from this graphic is that green is on top. More conservation has more benefits for the environment. But we can ask about other kinds of, I'm just going to show you a couple of graphs that look just like this one, but have different values going up this way. So we can look at soil conservation. We can look at the conservation of species. And now the lines diverge a little less, but the green one is still on top. But then we can look at other criteria, like now what is the value of commodity production? Well, then you go in a different direction. Now the conservation is on the bottom, and more money for making commodities on the top. But that's just a start. This is like scratching the surface of what this group can do. Because what they do, and again, this is don't look at the details. All I want to impress on you here is that every column, every column of 
maps is for a different benefit of nature. So they can look at the quality of water, soils, um, sopping up carbon from the atmosphere, whatever it is. And you can ask, all right, what if we do all these things? And in the end, the result is that if you take into account these benefits of nature, nature has more value than what you do if you converted the land to agriculture or cities. And so by taking a broader view, you realize that nature does have value for people. Okay, so I want to come back in just the last couple minutes. And so I already brought up one example of how North Carolina benefits from conserving nature, my beer Super Bowl example. But let me give you another one that really um, impressed me. Because I work for the Nature Conservancy as a board member, and the board of the Nature Conservancy has been wrestling. If anybody's interacted with the Nature Conservancy, you might think of, or what I think of is, they protect land. Like that's like the number one mission of the Nature Conservancy. But now they're being asked to protect land and protect the value of the land for people. So how do you combine those two goals? So let me give you one example that I just found from Helen. And this takes us east to a type of habitat known as Pocosin peatlands. These are, they would look as wetlands, not on the ocean, but just inland from the ocean. And so Pocosin is a Native American word that means swamp on a hill. So these habitats sort of go shallowly up into domes and then they're wet. And so they have deep soils that are full of, that are peat, like going way down into the, into the soil. And then what you see on the top is cedars and shrubs, various plants. Well, what do I want to tell you about these types of habitats? First, they're abundant down east in North Carolina. All these black areas are these Pocosin peatland swamps. But what people did when they moved onto the land is drain them so that they could plant fields on these swamps. Well, what is the consequence of that? It turns out that peatlands, so this deep organic soil, covers only 3% of the earth. But that 3% of the earth has as much carbon as 75% of the atmosphere. And it's got twice the carbon as all the ecosystems in the world combined. So you have all this carbon that's stored, and yet people ditched and drained them, so then, and, they, and then if fires are set, it's burned, it goes back in the atmosphere. So it's a valuable ecosystem for people that's being lost because of how we treated them. Or just put it another way, what the Nature Conservancy's found is that when you um, protect one hectare, so that's about two acres, of peatland of these pocosids, it's the equivalent of removing nearly one passenger vehicle per year from the road. And then the flip side is, if you drain the Pocosin, it's like adding five vehicles per year to the road. And so here's an interesting example that, to me, reconciles the goals of the Nature Conservancy. On the one hand, they're protecting land, their traditional strength. But by protecting the land, they're protecting a service of taking carbon out of the atmosphere. And so what I've tried to do is, um, oh, I don't, oh, all this slide does is say we're linking from ecosystems to services that ecosystems provide to the value to people. And so what I've tried to do here is to just give you an overview of how we can understand the value of nature. And then I've given you two North Carolina examples, but they're not from the triangle. And then what I'd like to do is here are your interests or um, points of discussion about how we might think about the benefits of nature for people in Chapel Hill or in the Triangle area or wherever. So with that, I will stop and just go on. This is a, a little bit off of what you just ended with, but recently in Wake County, they chose the orange root or whatever. Oh, it was terrible. I can't stand that. And anyway. I, I guess what I was going to ask is I understand that's the wetlands and everything like that. And, and 
is there any way to make an argument to people in term, terms of you know the benefit that would accrue to them for not using that? So I've gotten involved in this discussion a bit because the road, Interstate 540 going south, is now plowing over the wetlands that are home to very endangered mussel species. And it kills me to see this. And they're you know, trying to mitigate, which means they're going to likely create a lab to, to propagate these mussels and then put them who knows where. But I think there is the, um, the opportunity because it would be possible, honestly, to make that road and yet to not degrade the services any more. I mean, these are uplands, our farms or cities or what have you. So the areas up are already used intensively by people. But what's not used intensively as you go down into the river, that whole area is um, is a um, is, is um, fairly natural. The way, in my view, the way to get around this is to um, well, first of all, the services are protecting water quality, and that's right off the bat. Creating a road degrades water quality immediately. But there are ways to get around that if you build the road in such a way that it passes totally over the wetland without degrading the habitat, and that's possible, then you could protect the services, but still have the road. Yes, it would be more costly, but it's not that much more costly in my view. So yes, I think that argument can be made. I don't think we're making it very well. That precludes doing a lot of bit. Doing what? I said that precludes doing a lot of bit, which is not To do what? I didn't hear that. Low bid, yes. It does preclude. But if you could make the argument that there are benefits to people, then, see, that just changes the whole equation, literally the equation, of what is the low bid. Yes, you could make a lower bid for making a road, but then there's, if you add the cost of making the cheapest road over time, then all of a sudden it's not the lowest bid, it's maybe the highest bid. That's the shift in perspective that is needed. And still, we're not very good at it. Except, you know, there is an exception to where we are good at it, which is the Clean Water Conservation Trust Fund. And so the Clean Water Trust Conservation Trust Fund is state government um, legislated to protect water quality. And traditionally, it has been used in agricultural areas where historically, you know, cows were just eating up to the stream or into the stream. And so there are mandated distances from a stream or river that cannot be developed. But a lot of that goes to the state government's Clean Water Trust Fund. And when I first moved here and saw the amount of land conservation that has happened through the Clean Water Trust Fund, I mean, it measures into the billions, like a billion or billions of dollars. It's a huge amount for exactly the reason you're bringing up, except not in the place that you're bringing up. And it's also been very threatened in the recent state legislature. So we've been fighting against that. Well, I have. What else? Yeah, in the back. You didn't talk about saving money. In order to, in order to save money, Flint, Michigan switched from Detroit water to Flint oh. water. And, oh. uh, and there were warnings, but how can you get them to realize the bigger Well, that's, I mean, that is just on a different scale. I, that is a different scale than just protecting nature. That is about protecting I mean, people directly. That's appalling what happened. And so it's a different scale because I, I just think anybody in their right mind would think that's a bad thing. Of course, except for the mayor of Flint or whatever. I mean, it just gets crazy. So that's a, that is a different level, though. They um, saved money. They did save money, but they were just so unethical. Even, I mean, if you, it is nature. It is a service of nature, but it's at a different level of, I don't know. I would like to think that most people would be better than that. When they count up all the costs of remediation for the oh, savings it's gonna be it's gonna cost them oh. Oh. Somebody else had a question. Let me hear it. Time. If you find, of course, 
contact with this ton, and is it also a, a real good uh, carbon sink? It is. So tundra are the biggest areas of peatlands in the world. I mean, North Carolina is the biggest area that harbors peatlands in, in the United States. But the tundra, so the tundra is defined by, um, well, obviously low temperatures and very low precipitation. So there's only a couple months a year where it's possible for plants to grow. And if any plant grows above the snow, that part of the plant is sheared off by blowing wind and snow and ice. And then, because it's so cold, the plants don't, they don't decompose very rapidly. And so you get very acidic and organic soils that also retain water year round. But they are, they are peat soils. That's where the dominant amount of peat soils is. So it's an, the, the good news is, though, that those are places that are not, they're not as threatened. But they're probably, they're threatened more by climate change. I mean, as you go further north, climate change has a greater and greater effect. So you had a question. Or did you have a question? You had another question. So, oh. Um, so oh, sorry. Didn't see you. Go ahead. So wetlands mitigation, the idea that, you know, when you make a road, you go through a wetland and you ruin it. It's a North Carolina it's federal law or state law. Yes, it so can you be mitigate, either. you mitigate the space. So how effective is that truly? I mean, they, they have to do it to a certain standard. It's a mix, is the truth of the matter. So, people who restore wetlands are getting quite good at it. And it, it really depends on the type of wetland. And what restoration itself is very difficult. So, it takes a dedicated effort and a great knowledge of science and also the practical means of restoration happening. So, how well it actually happens, it's a mixed bag. If people dedicate their effort to it, it can be done pretty well. Maybe not perfectly, but pretty well. The problem is it's often a one-off, like, oh, we're going to restore this, or we're going to mitigate by doing this. And yet, you know, a, a half job is done, so really the mitigation doesn't happen even though it's legally approved. And so there's no, like, follow-up a year later to make sure it's still working? There is some follow-up, but it's, you know, what are the standards of, if you're destroying a natural area, then what are the standards of making it natural again? And it's, it is actually hard to assess the, or to hold a bar that's so precisely natural. But we can be good. We can be good. Yes, Mark. There was one uh, part of your talk that I was confused about, and that is when you said benefits to the people in Africa uh, because they had large mammals, tigers, and lions. Yes. What exactly is the benefit to people? It's touristry. Oh. So they get people to come in and see these things, and then people come in and spend money. I mean, there are other costs, and this is where I get, I get actually get involved through my, what I talked to you about at first, the landscape corridors. So one problem with wildlife, I mean, especially ele elephants now that are becoming more numerous, is that when they come into contact with people, they can have very damaging effects. And so then how do you keep a good population of elephants, but without having conflict between people and elephants? And so there are ideas for making these corridors that, uh, or preserving lands that are along natural corridors for elephants or other animals um, without putting them in direct <laughs> conflict with people. Anyway, but it's, but it's tourists. Oh, did you have that? Oh, go ahead. When you're talking about assessing the value of something, especially as a surface, um, for instance, monarch butterflies or something, or things that pollinate, we'll say yes. bees. I mean, is there any systematic argument or evaluation that gets made to the people who make the laws that would prevent the uh, destruction of, of this? Like There's some. So uh, when you brought up monarchs, so 
So some of you may have heard of the White House Pollinator Initiative, which came out this last year. And there's a lot of money now being dedicated to monarchs and pollinators. So monarchs capture people's attention because when I ask people, it could be grade school students or adults, I say, how many butterflies can you name? And most people can name a monarch. And most people cannot name one other type of butterfly. But so, and there's a reason that it's captured our imagination because it has this incredible migration. And we can often see monarchs. So it's recognizable. It's this just um, miracle of nature, really, that it makes this long trip. That, so it's declined, and it has declined by 94% in the last 12 years. I mean, any time that happens, you know you have a problem. There are still a good number of monarchs, but we're talking about down from a billion to 30 million monarchs. Well, if that trajectory continues, they're gone. And so the White House has wrapped in monarchs and pollinators to recreate natural environments, particularly in the Great Plains, where there's opportunities to plant milkweeds, plant other flowers. And so now as a researcher, I, I don't study monarchs, but I have had more phone calls or opportunities to do work on monarchs in the last year than I have ever had in my life. And so people do think about that. And they do think, yeah, they think about the value of bees. Another example is in Great Britain, for hedgerow conservation, farmers get money for conserving their hedgerows and demonstrating that they've done certain things to increase the number of pollinators or the types of birds or this or that. So there, it is being measured and feeds back to people that live in the environment. Those are, uh, well, one other example is in Iowa, where it's mandated by the state that the areas around roads, so if you drive down, like when I drive back to Raleigh, there's the road, but then there's grasses along the road that are just mowed down and they're not native or whatever. In Iowa, you're required to maintain the roadside in its natural habitat. So often that's grassland, but it might not be grassland. And it has to be maintained as it was naturally. And so what I'd like to see is that type of effort expanded to, well, everywhere. Yeah. So I know. Yeah, oh, there's an example of 
bumblebees are declining. Oh, they're affected as much, but I, I was on a panel of the National Academy of Sciences that was asking, what is the problem of pollinator decline? And what I learned at that panel is we know exactly how much honeybees are declining because people keep them and they make honey and etc. But we all know almost nothing about all the other bees. And what's weird there is that honeybees are not native to the United States. They're European, mainly European or Asian. And but it's the the weird thing is we know what they're doing, but we don't know what's happening to the other bees. Now people are turning their attention to other bees, so we're learning more and more, but there is a discrepancy. Yes, yeah. Um, I was wondering if if you had suggested answers to your question about what are things in the triangle that we could be focusing on. Well, it depends on what you want to, like what is the goal? That's the question. For me, what I care about is connecting nature. So that's what I focus on in the triangle. And so just as an example, I assume some of you are from Raleigh or Wake County. In Raleigh, Wake County, we have a greenway system. And it's extensive as you move out from the center of the city, and it's more minimal as you go into the center of the city. But what I want to see are more um, areas like that that are beneficial for nature and are beneficial for people who use them as greenways or what have you. Um, and there are other benefits. What I worry about in my work is that the more the world becomes urban, the less that people see nature. And that's a scary discrepancy because, you know, even when I grew up, I lived in the city, but I lived next to nature. I could get on my bike and go out in the natural areas, and my kids cannot do that. And so then when there becomes this disconnect, then people care less about nature. So what I, my own view is, yes, just getting people to experience nature in cities and to care more about nature. But there are other things that um, can be done. I, I think there are opportunities to restore native vegetation that can harbor pollinators or other um, native species. There are um, these, these corridors also preserve water quality, which is important in, and you brought up water quality. I mean, that's, we're in an urban environment where we're plowing through 540 and that will degrade water quality. Um, yeah, so those are the kinds of things I think about. But really it comes back to what, are, what is important to you? And then we can ask the question, what is important to you? And can we then, I mean, that's essentially what was being asked. Can we uh, improve nature in ways that have values to people? But then also, I mean, realistically, we still have to we have a lot of people that have to get around, that have to live, and so there are benefits to that, but we have to weigh the benefits of nature against that. And so, what we've done, in my view, the way we've approached nature in the past is plow the road wherever. I mean, we have roads everywhere, put them wherever, worry about nature second. Now I think we have to turn that on its head and think, all right, how can we do these things that are important for people, like making roads, but do so in a way that has the least effect on nature. Or you can actually turn that on its head, its head where nature actually benefits things like roads. Because if you miss site roads, then they are eroded or they have other problems for environments, whereas you can actually take advantage of natural environments to benefit roads themselves. Yeah. So how is North Carolina doing relative to other states? So it's mixed is what it is. So where the environmental perspective benefits in North Carolina is that besides living where you live, what do you think about, or what do people think about when they think about North Carolina? They're not thinking about Charlotte or Raleigh, most of them. They're thinking about the mountains, or they're thinking about the coast. And so there are natural areas that really should be protected. And um, in ways that benefit people, because tourists or whatever positive things that come uh, from those, that recognition. 
or from us who want to go to the ocean or go to the mountains. I think we do a worse job in the ocean, it's the bottom line, or on the coast, because you know we just stick houses right up around the coast. And I don't know, another of the rarest butterflies that I work on is in the path of that kind of development between Emerald Isle and Atlantic Beach. I think about that a little more. And so the point is though that I would say except for the big cities, so I'm now counting the Triangle, especially in Charlotte, we have opportunities in North Carolina. I mean, we have those natural environments, the Clean Water Management Trust Fund is exemplary, I think, for how conservation can be done. We have mixed, uh, uh, we get mixed support from the legislatures right now, but historically we had good support for environment. Yeah, oh, uh, well, let's, we'll alter. So, one of the interesting things is the carbon trading movement and so emissions reduction in that way. So, the corporations and governments yeah. will be making investments in these spaces to for emissions reduction plans. I mean, is that what natural capital flows are? It, it's definitely connected, yes. So, natural capital will not speak directly to cap and trade carbon uh, standards. Not directly, but if you recognize the uh, link between carbon and temperature or climate and the effects of climate on people and ecosystems, then Frankly, the only endpoint is reducing carbon emissions. And if you, um, so like COP21, which is the Paris meetings that happened a few months ago, it was a huge advance forward in dealing with carbon and climate. And yet, if you look at the, um, at the what, what governments committed to in carbon reduction, we are still, we have to cut by 50% more to get to two degrees warming from now. And by something like um, 66 to 75% more to get to 1.5 degrees warming. And so a lot has to be done. But how is that going to happen? My own view is to side with carbon um, cap and trade as a way forward that first sets limits to carbon, but then allows some flexibility in who is producing the carbon that is emitted. But you know, I think there are different ways forward. That's my, that's my own personal take, but I think there are other ways forward. But the bottom line is carbon emissions have to come down. And yes, last year, I don't know if you all saw this in the papers two weeks ago, Last year was the warmest year on record by far. Just and and there there is some interesting links between that and the El Nino year. So if you look at um, temperature changes over time, well, it's constantly up. But it's kind of like the stock market over the last 120 years. Over the 120 years, it's the trend is upward, but you get ups and downs all along. And in the El Nino year, it goes up. But that's linked to climate warming as well because warming heated this ocean, which created this powerful El Nino, which skyrocketed the last year's temperatures even further. So the point is, I see that and it scares me because I know the ecological consequences, and that's what, in the end, I'm most interested in.